My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our webinar with forest ecologist and author Suzanne Samard, who joins us from Nelson, British Columbia. She'll be in conversation with Matt Evans of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Today's event is a partnership between the Glencoe Public Library, the Chicago Botanic Garden, the Bookstall, the Glencoe Sustainability Task Force, and the Friends of the Green Bay Trail. Our special thanks go out to Becky Maganuco and Meredith Clement of the Friends of the Green Bay Trail. It was their initiative that set the wheels in motion for this program to happen, so thank you. And now I'll introduce our speakers. Dr. Suzanne Samard is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. She is author of the book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, which is being released in vintage, by Vintage in paperback today. So we catch her on a very exciting day. Born in the Monashi Mountains of British Columbia, Suzanne holds a PhD and MSc in forest ecology from Oregon State University and a bachelor's degree in forest ecology uh, sorry, and a bachelor's degree in forest resource management from the University of British Columbia. She obtained registered professional forester status in 1986. Suzanne is known for her work on how trees interact and communicate using below ground fungal networks, which has led to the recognition that forests have hub trees or mother trees, which are large, highly connected trees that play an important role in the flow of information and resources in a forest. Her current research investigates how these complex relationships contribute to forest resiliency, adaptability, and recovery, and has far-reaching implications for how to manage and heal forests from human impacts, including climate change. Suzanne has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and presented at conferences around the world. She's communicated her work to a wide audience through interviews, documentary films, and her TED Talk, How Trees Talk to Each Other. There is so much praise for finding the mother tree that it's hard to choose one, but I offer this one from the Washington Post, which said, like Charles Darwin's findings, Samard's results are so revolutionary and controversial that they have quickly worked their way into social theory, urban planning, culture, and art. Samard's work knocks 19th century notions of inevitable competition off their pedestals. If a forest is a commons where the fate of the weakest is tied to that of the strongest, then we have a lot of rethinking to do. Today's event is moderated by Matt Evans, who is the managing ecologist for, the wood, for woodlands at the Chicago Botanic Garden here in Glencoe. He is also involved in the environmental work through, through several organizations that focus mostly on volunteer community stewardship in area forest preserves. Understanding the impacts of invasive species and how to restore natural areas back to health is central to Matt's work. He considers the management of invasives to be an opportunity for communities to work together on meaningful projects that transform natural areas from declining spaces to thriving resources, providing ecosystem services, refuges for biodiversity, and natural beauty. Suzanne and Matt, thank you so much for being with us and taking time to do this today. And I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And Suzanne, it's such a pleasure and honor to meet you and have this discussion. Likewise. <laughs> may I say um, happy summer solstice. Um, and the release day for your paperback is, of course, um, auspicious. That's great. Um, so <laughs> being a forest uh, dweller of some type of my own, um, I understand that being in the field and sitting down to write a book are very different. Can you tell us what you liked and disliked about writing the book? That's a great question. Um, you know, what I, what I loved the most was the freedom to tell my story in my own words and way of, way of writing and expressing myself after, you know, a whole career of write, writing scientific articles where it's very, rigid and prescriptive almost about how you write a scientific article. So I think I just enjoyed that freedom and to watch what came on to the page, right? I was just surprised even myself as I was writing and how creative um, I could be. And, and of course, I learned so much too, right? Writing a book is so different than writing articles. You know, the arc of the story is long and complex and, um, and the way you you express yourself is is just so um, 
it allows you to explore so much more. Um, you know, it, it, when you're discussing your scientific work, you have to you have to hone to the the, the actual results so closely. You, you can't you can't far you wander very far. Um, and so your your ability to really reach into yourself about what it means is very limited. So anyway, I totally enjoyed every aspect of that. Uh, the part that I didn't enjoy, I guess, sitting for hours on my bum, <laughs> especially when it was sunny outside and the forest was beckoning me, but um, I still got out. Um, and, and so that it wasn't it wasn't so bad. I think I know how you probably dealt with writer's block. Um, <laughs> well, let me say that when reading your book, I could really feel that. And one who reads scientific articles as well in our field, it really felt like this, you really humanized the science for me and also told a story that felt very familiar. And I think familiar to many others. Thank you. Um, one example I wanted to, to draw out and hear a little more from you about was this, this dramatic and compelling example of your writing style which and your storytelling, where in a chapter you're finding scat from a grizzly bear then a piece of a leg from a deer and then you <laughs> and this is happening while you're describing some of the scientific reasons you're out in the woods with a colleague and mm -hmm. and then you find the grizzly bear with her cubs and mm -hmm. um could you tell us a little bit more about what happened after that i can but before i get get into what happened it's like that was the chapter that i wanted to start with that you know i had written parts of that chapter in the years earlier and just thought this is the beginning of a book and and it's funny like to me it was like the most exciting chapter because that was such an exciting moment in my life um but when I went to publish my book the whole you know the whole number of chapters 15 chapters that was the one that the editor wanted to cu cut out because it was the one that could be thrown out and not lose the plot line I guess of the whole book and they were trying to shorten it down and make it oh. And I was just like, oh, that's my favorite chapter. <laughs> um, but anyway, it it stayed. It's lovely. I love it. Um, so the way that that story ended, yes. I mean, I was up hiking with my best friend, Jean. Um, we were in our early 20s. We were way up in this alpine valley, hanging valley. Um, there were all kinds of signs of grizzly. It's, a, you know, it's grizzly country. Um, we were two young girls on our own and just wanting to get to the alpine. And we kept coming across you know, all these science, big footprints in the, in the muck and big bear, bear scat and big claw marks on the trees. And, and so then we came back down the trail and stayed overnight in this trapper's cabin. And it was, you know, the next day we thought, okay, we got to get out of here. We're obviously not welcome that these bears, this is their valley. It's not ours. Um, and, and so we were walking down the mountain and getting, you know, sort of down, down, down and getting into more like non grizzly territory. At least that's what we thought. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I was right beside Jean and she stopped all of a sudden and I, I smucked into her pack and she goes, and I go, what's going on? And she goes, it's a grizzly. And right there, like 10 feet away, there was a mama grizzly and two cubs looking at us going, and we, we were like all shocked. And, and Jean backs up and she says, well, I'm going up that tree over there. And I'm like, and, and meantime, the mama had sent her cubs was scurrying them off to this other tree. And so I picked a tree. And so we're all climbing these trees, like the, the bears and us, except mama bear stayed down because she, you know, grizzlies are, when they're adults, they're too heavy to, to actually crawl up a tree. They they fall down because they're weight, uh, but cubs can. They've got sharp little claws and they, up they go. And so the little cubs went way, way up this ponderosa pine and Gina and I were climbing our trees. And I started to realize that my tree was a lot smaller than Jean's and because my tree started to sway back and forth because as I was getting near the terminal bud it was like it couldn't hold my weight um and so Jean kept going and I was like this going back and forth and mama bear was right at the base of my tree waiting for me like practically with her jaws open salivating that I was going to jump you know fall out of this tree but anyway she it turns out you know we were up there for an hour um the cubs fell asleep up in their tree Jean and I were you know really scared but the, it was the mama bear that was in charge of everything. Like she knew what to do. She, her purpose was to protect her cubs. And in her, inadvertently, she was protecting us too, because she didn't want this big, you know, this big drama. <laughs> and so eventually she 
got her cubs to grunted and they came down. You could hear them scratch, 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 scratch coming down the trunks. And then you could hear them sort of padding away up the valley. And then a little while later, Jean said, okay, we got to go. And so I'm like, I don't want to go. <laughs> but we came down and then we just ran out of the valley and we were fine. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was that moment that I, you know, I realized that it was the trees and it was that mama bear, you know, those mothers in the forest that saved all of us. Wow, what a great connection to the mother trees. <laughs> um, in your own words, how would you describe a mother tree? Um, they're really the biggest trees in the forest. So it doesn't matter what species. It, it Usually the biggest trees are also the oldest trees in the forest, but many forests are all similar age, even age forests. But usually they're the biggest, oldest trees. And the reason that they're so sentinel in the forest, it's so important, is because they have large crowns, um, large capacity to, to photosynthesize. They send a lot of energy down into their root systems and their root systems are massive, bigger than smaller trees. They're all this crown area is correlated with, you know, their sapwood area is correlated with their root area and it's the number of root tips. And so they have many linkages through their mycorrhizal fungi to many other trees in the forest. So the mycorrhizas are these obligate fungi that um, mutualistic fungi that that use photosynthate from the tree to grow mycelium through the soil, and they pick up nutrients and water that they trade back with the tree for, for energy, for photosynthate. And these fungi can link the trees together in the forest. And so these big old trees have the greatest density of linkages. And, and so they're the hubs of the forest. If you imagine this big internet with, with a big hub in the middle of it, with all these links, that's the mother tree. Oh, thank you. That's such an excellent description. And the importance of these mother trees and the sustainability of the woods and something that Grace mentioned was, was part of the Washington Post um, writing was that they, they have really helped us as a scientific community and a human community understand the, the cooperative behavior of a woodland rather than the traditional ecological thinking of just a, or I should say the, the, the thinking before your research of how it was mostly competitive. <laughs> so could you say a little more about that? Yeah, you know, you're right. Like we've, um, you know, competition has really dominated ecological thinking and of course, evolutionary thinking too, for a long time since Darwin um, wrote Origin of Species and, um, and, and it really has shaped not just how we think of evolution and speciation, but also how, how plant communities and animal communities are structured. So that, you know, competition is like the main, is thought, was thought for a long, long time to be the main driver of, of mortality or, or slower growth or, um, or, yeah, or just the advancement of a species and the, and how, you know, which, which plants become dominant and which ones become subdominant or die out. And, and the, you know, it's important to know that like every organism, as we learn more, you know, they are a consortium of, of, co of cooperatives, right? They, they're, you know, we are full of bacteria and fungi and viruses and all kinds of creatures as are trees, right? They have endophytes, they have mutualists that live on their roots, they have bacteria that live all over them. Um, they have, you know, bears that can live inside of them that ha have their babies there. So it, a tree really is a, as well a consortium of cooperation. And, um, and, and it's not trivial that our thinking has been in that container for a long time, because what it's done is it's shaped how we manage our communities, our plant communities, right? We, we, we um, have developed all kinds of cultural practices to favor the, the dominant tree or the, the competitor, the one that can compete the most. And we've, you know, actually weeded out forests and weeded out grasslands and weeded out shrub communities um, in a cultivation sense so that we grow bigger um, crop, crops that we want. And, and the cost of that is biodiversity. And with, with losing biodiversity, we lose ecological function. Um, these things are correlated. And, um, and so, yeah, so what my work showed is that, yeah, you know, trees do co compete. There's no doubt one tree can shade another tree and preempt light. There's no doubt that a tree can, you know, preempt water from another plant and, and you know, and maybe even, you know, that plant could 
even die if it was in a very precarious position. But at the same time, at the very same time, cooperation is going on. These things are not exclusive of each other. They go together. There's all kinds of ways that plants interact with each other. Competition and, co and cooperation are two of them. Um, and it turns out like when we look at evolutionary and ecological systems, um, that co cooperation is actually more common <laughs> in nature than competition. Um, and so um, then, you know, when you start realizing that, you think, wow, well, all of these management practices that we do worldwide, our crop systems, our forestry systems, our fishery systems are based on this idea that competition is most important. That means that they need to be, you know, re rethought and reorganized and redesigned. Yeah. So that brings me to this other question I've been dying to ask you, which is what would you say, um, or I should say one day in the future, what would be a thing you want to see happening or hear people discussing that would make you think, aha, it made a difference. It worked. Yeah. Well, lots of things, but I think the most important thing right now that we face as a, as a global community, as a human race, as our planet, <laughs> um, is that we're, we're undergoing this massive you know, em emergency called climate change. And along with climate change, you know, we have all kinds of knock-on effects that are affecting everybody in their everyday lives, whether it's from a heat dome or a, you know, he heat crisis in the east of U.S. right now to what I'm going through in the east, which, or in the west, which is like too much, you know, lots of rain and really cold summers to snowfall, you know, in the springtime when it shouldn't be happening. Um, so we're all feeling this effect of climate change as are our forests. And, and yet forests um, are one of our biggest natural solutions to climate change. So as our forests are being stressed, there's a whole bunch of things going on. They're, they're, you know, they're becoming maladapted to the new climate. And so that means that, you know, as they stress, there's more mortality. Um, and, at, and at the same time, as a human race, we're continuing to cut down our forests at a, as an ever, at a, a very rapid rate. In fact, an ever increasing rate. While these forests that remain are huge st storehouses for carbon. Um, and so as we, as we mow down our forests, we're actually exacerbating the climate change problem. Um, and at the same time, if we protect our forests and restore our forests, we can, they can actually become a climate change solution. So we're heading in the wrong direction, right? We're heading in exactly the wrong direction um, with respect to forests. And so my wish is, um, if I could wish one thing, is that protect our remaining old growth forests, old forests, primary forests, and restore the rest of the forests that are right now underperforming with respect to biodiversity and, and carbon sequestration. Yes, it's such a, it's so it's it's so important and compelling to hear you say that and and it's it's just great for the audience to hear it come from the source. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so now that we know a little bit about the problem, some of the research and what we're learning about the problem, and also just discovering more about our natural ecosystems, um, where do where do uh, or I should ask first before the next one is um, what is the Mother Tree Project? Could you yeah. tell me and the audience a little more about the Mother Tree Project? Yeah. So just building on the last question of what can we do to find natural solutions to climate change, that is what drove me or compelled me to do to construct the Mother Tree Project. So, you know, our our traditional management practice practices in North America. Um, South America, in the Congo, it doesn't matter where you go, um, is to is to, you know, the worldview is let's let's use our forests for our, our own economic value um, and let's do it as cheaply as possible. Um, and the, the tragedy of this is that that means that we don't invest in caring for our forests. We do everything at the most expedient uh, and cheapest way possible. And what that means for forestry is that clear cutting our old growth forests and then planting them back to plantations that are not even close to what they look like as old growth forests is what we have, what we are turning, that's what we are doing. And so when you look at, you know, you know what, what kinds of practices are gonna conserve those two very precious things, carbon stocks and biodiversity, and all the concomitant things that go with that, which is clean water, you know, good quality uh, water regimes, um, clean air, 
um, you know, regulated climate. Um, what scientists show over and over again is that, you know, leaving a lot, of, a, a good canopy cover, even while you're harvesting the forest, protects those values. And so the Mother Tree Project is, is about how do you do that? How can you leave mother trees behind to do um, all the good things that they do, connecting the forest, helping regeneration, helping carbon stock stay in the ground, in the forest, you know, keeping mosses and lichens, you know, still there instead of disappearing. Um, how can you do that? And can we demonstrate that you can do it? And so what we're doing is across this big climate gradient from hot, dry climates in Douglas fir forests to cold, wet climates, we have a distributed nine research forests where we're trying different harvesting techniques, leaving behind these old mother trees, and then in different patterns and different configurations, and then measuring what is the response of the ecosystem. And, and like I said, the, the, the response is, Leaving more trees behind helps protect ecosystems. It's, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. It's logical, but we're measuring it. Um, and, and we're also finding, you know, because climate change is changing so quickly, you know, there's a velocity to climate change that is much more rapid than trees can migrate or any plant can mi migrate. The seeds can't migrate northward or upward fast enough to keep up with the warming climate. Um, so we have to we're trying to assist that migration. Um, and so we're planting different warmer seed genotypes um, into areas and colder ones and seeing how, you know, whether these old trees will protect the new migrants coming into the forest. And what we're finding is that they actually, they do. So we're getting increased survival rate of new migrants from more burn climates, um, which is really great. Like these, when you go into these beautiful forests with lots of mother trees left behind, the understory is just, is full of new regeneration. The new seedlings are doing great. There's lush plant communities. And when you have that kind of bursting of life coming out of a forest, you know that it's recovering very well and we're measuring that. Um, so yeah, and so that's that was the Mother Tree Project. It's, it's five or six or seven years old now and we're trying to expand the concept so that it's not just an experiment, but it's actually a movement, <laughs> a movement where we can actually help communities, um, First Nations or Indigenous communities, local communities, people who live near forests, how to work with their forests in order to um, protect those old, the old ones, because they're so important, um, and also to re revitalize forests that have been damaged so that we can get them back to where you know, where they're as vibrant and as productive and as uh, capable as possible of, of pulling in the carbon dioxide and protecting species. And so that leads me, of course, to how is it going in terms of people listening? Are the yeah. industries and, I mean, yeah. certainly other researchers and passionate people like myself are. You know, the public has got a keen ear to this, which is really great because this makes sense. Right. If it didn't make sense, then we wouldn't. I wouldn't. We wouldn't have traction on this. On this. Uh, on this story. On on this science. Um, it would seem too obtuse, but it makes sense to people. Um, and so I, I would say the uptake globally has been tremendous. When it comes to governments, though, it's a completely different story. So unless governments are pushed to change, they will just keep the status quo. And so where I come from in Western Canada, in British Columbia, they have no intention of changing the status quo, which is to keep cutting forests as fast as, you know, at the same rate, um, you know, this keeping the same level of cuts, still clear cutting. Um, they'll they'll change a little bit if, if the public pushes them to try alternative harvesting systems, but they're really loath to change, you know, the amount of wood they cut. And, and I would say that's typical of many places around the world. So we still have a lot of work to do, right? We, you know, and, and we have to remember that you know, governments work for people and people are the ones that need to tell their governments, we don't, we don't agree with this. And it, and it really does take people like scientists can do their work and, and write their papers and write books, but, but it's, it, that doesn't change governments and it doesn't change policies. It informs them once they're ready for change, but what makes change is that people demand change. And so we still have to get to that point. We still have to demand governments to make change and we're not there yet in Canada. And one of my questions was going to be, what can the audience members do individually? But it sounds like demand change is one of those things. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, like our lives depend on this. Um, you know, the, the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change announces, we probably all, your audience have heard, you know, we have till 2030 to really change um, the equation here, you know, to, to get off fossil fuels as our primary energy source um, and to start restoring our ecosystems and to, to, and to go to net zero deforestation. And um, by 2030, and a whole bunch of countries have signed on to do this. But when you look at what's actually happening on the ground, it actually, do, they're not really doing this, right? Um, and so people, we need to keep our governments and hold them to account. And let me give you a specific example, what I mean about that last thing. And I'll just use Canada as an example, because I'll own this to, for my country, is that, you know, at 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 COP26 in, in uh, was it in, in Glasgow, um, you know, the, 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 they called for net zero deforestation by 2030, a whole bunch of countries signed on, including Canada, including 130 other countries. And when you come back to Canada and you say, oh, that's so great, you know, that you, we did this, you come back and look at the details of what they said. And they said, actually, cutting down an old growth forest and planting trees does not count as deforestation. Wow. But, you know, cutting down a, a forest and not planting trees does count as deforestation. So, so in Canada, then we have net no net deforestation already. But when it comes to carbon stocks, when you cut down a forest, an old growth forest, you immediately lose 70% of the carbon stocks to the atmosphere or to maybe slightly longer term uh, storage products. And you can't get that back. Right. That is from a global change point of view, that is deforestation. And so we need to own this. Right. And, and you can be sure that shenanigans like that are going on in, you know, probably every country in the world. We need to own that, what this really means, because unless we do, you know, it's not going to have an effect. We've really got we've really got to hold our governments to account and say, actually, you know, that does count as deforestation. Anyway, we've got to do this if we're really going to get there. Absolutely. Here in the in the prairie state in Illinois, we liken the deforestation to the destruction of the tall grass prairie, which took a, a century and a half. But the carbon released from that is very similar. So yeah. understanding the forestry side of things, can we change gears to a different ecological issue that I wanted to know how your research um, in, is impacting? And that is invasive species. Are we finding shifts in mycorrhizal communities that are connecting or are we you know, could you speak a little bit to that when, it's, when an ecosystem yeah. is invaded? What changes about the factors of the ecosystem you study? Yeah, so in the ecosystems I study in Western Canada, we're just at the beginning where invasive species are becoming more prominent. Um, when I started in my career as a forester in the early 1980s, I never saw invasive species. Now you go up into, you know, even like back roads that are brand new, you start seeing scotch broom showing up and knapweed and and broom, broom and um and so what happens well in a forestry context as soon as you cut down a forest you you actually um you know an intact forest has about a i say a good ballpark figure is about 100 species of fungi in an old growth forest and when you cut it down and convert that to a plantation you're down to maybe five species and they're uh, they're not the old growth fungi. They're the the what are called I call weedy species. So they're like the invasives, kind of the invasives of the plant world. Except they're they're actually native fungi, but they're they dominate the root systems of the young seedlings. And the reason that they're so prolific and so successful is because they don't have big carbon demands from this from the seedlings because this, and the seedlings are small and they can't support you know you know the bigger fleshier uh, more complex fungi. So they get these weedy species on them, a handful of them. And then, you know, if it's a single species plantation, you never actually really recover that same fungal species diversity as if you had a multiple multiple plant and tree species plantation. So, so you end up simplifying the fungal plantation, the fungal community immediately from a hundred to say five species and not just not just the number, but the, the kind of species changes from a, a multiplicity of old growth fungi that have all kinds of niches to a few species that are very fine and very easy to support. 
and that have similar functions of, of getting at water and nutrients for those plants. In a, in a more invaded uh, community, so let's say you're in a prairie that's been invaded by knapweed or brome, <laughs> um, just, you know, in my worst imagination, that would be terrible. But um, again, you know, what, what will happen is that is that these invasive plants find gaps in the community. So if the community is um, has some kind of stress in it, um, then invasives can make their way in. Um, if it's been disturbed, then there's a there's a space left in that ecosystem. Invasives then can, can, can come in. They can even come into you know intact plant communities if there's a lot of pressure from invasives around that intact plant community. The role that mycorrhizas can play into that is that a lot of these invasive species like knapweed and brome, they have on their roots arbuscular mycorrhizas for the most part, or they can be non-mycorrhizal, but these arbuscular mycorrhizas, it's very low species diversity, and they have all kinds of you know, strategies, just like the plants, to, to invade ecosystems. And one of the strategies that, that I, I talk about sometimes, and I don't study this, I don't study invasives, so, so this is just you know, the things that I know, but um, there are certain species of arbuscular fungi that can actually tap into the root systems of the native plants, and and you know they're linked to the exotic invader plant species, and then and they can actually suck out of those native plants the phosphorus and nitrogen, and and actually you know basically starve them to death um, in in order to promote their own growth, and so that's kind of um, it's a bit insidious. Um, I'll give you one other example. In the Arctic, I had a I have a I had a student years ago who was looking at uh, the greening of the Arctic and at Tulik Lake Experimental Research Station, and um, she was looking at um, uh, Betula nana, which is a which is a which is a small birch scrub plant, um, and it forms mycorrhizal networks between other Betula nanas, so they get become interwoven, um, and. As the permafrost is is starting to melt um, and it's becoming more conducive to shrub species, the networks that these these birch trees or these birch uh, small plants are involved in can actually help them advance into the into the into the tussock tundra that is now starting to open up because the the permafrost is starting to melt. And so, in that case, the network is actually advancing just through just through the ability to pass carbon from one plant to another, it actually gives them that head start in order to invade into the, into the tundra. And so, yeah, so these mycorrhizal networks, these fungi can actually advance or, or uh, speed up the invasion of otherwise pretty intact ecosystems. I think one really important thing that that makes me think of from your book is the description of how plants first got to land. Would you describe that to the audience? And yeah, I mean, so I'm not, words. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but um, about, you know, 380 million years ago is when land plants were, ev or plants in, in the oceans were starting to evolve and creep onto land and, and the earliest fossil records of land plants, when you look at the roots, they find there is a fossil record of our arbuscular mycorrhizas right in the roots. And so an arbuscular mycorrhiza is, it's a, it's a functional group of mycorrhizal fungi where um, they actually, they actually uh, grow inside the cortical cell of the plant and they form an arbuscule, which is, arbor, arbor is from tree, which is kind of like this uh, membrane, which with lots of enveloping surface area. Um, and that's where you can get, you know, exchange of photosynthate from these, these plants, these water plants, and then the fungus was very facilitative in, in, in enabling those plants to, to get nutrients from the rocky, hostile earth environment at that time that, you know, that really didn't have soil yet. And so they were instrumental, they were actually crucial in the ability of, of plants to move onto land. And then ultimately the evolution of higher level plants and the oxygenation of our environment. Um, so yeah, they were absolutely crucial. And thank you for describing it that way. And I'm sorry for asking you about things that you're not an expert in, but you certainly know enough to be dangerous. I'm <laughs> sure you've inspired a lot of students if they heard those uh, those comments to ask their own questions and perhaps even pursue them. Um, so in reading your book and studying your work a little bit, I have thought about how it relates to Merlin Sheldrake's 
Entangled, a book called Entangled that came out. Um, I'm not sure if it was before or after your book. I think after. And um, and I wanted to hear what you thought about or compare and contrast the, the stories or the uh, the information and the, the theses of the book. Yeah. So Merlin Sheldrake wrote, it's called Entangled Web, I believe. And it actually came out just before my book. In fact, I was finishing the last chapters um, and I got the news that this new book on called Entangled Web was coming out and it, that it cited some of my work. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, I thought, oh, I've missed it again. <laughs> Because I thought I've, I, I, I keep publishing, you know, I was working so hard to p- try to publish my book. And then, you know, in the years before, there were several books that came out that told part of my story. And um, anyway, Merlin's book is a wonderful book. It only, my part is just a small chapter near the end, but it's, it's, um, it is more about the, the fungal, the fungal web and, and, uh, how fungi work, um, their biology, their evolutionary biology. Um, whereas my book is more about forests and how fungal networks are uh, fundamental to the the functioning of a forest. So quite different takes on his. His is 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 I would say it's more it's much more focused on the fungi. Mine's more focused on the whole ecosystem. Um, but his is a wonderful book. He's a young guy, you know, in his late twenties when he wrote this book, and I'm just like. Mana, you know, that's f- fantastic. This young guy could write this beautiful book. Um, and I think that the books are complimentary, actually. That's what I thought, too. And I was I wanted to ask you about. So thank you. They really just brought that that higher level understanding of fungi and fungal networks and the kingdom of fun- fungi into the whole into the whole picture for people and really mm-hmm. brought relevant research that has developed over decades and brought them um, into sort of a description and then a case study. And so I really liked that. Um, so switching gears again, because we only have you for an hour or so, um, I've been dying to ask you because you do a lot of work with First Nations people and communities in Canada. And I wanted to ask from your work, what advice or insights do you have to offer to our global or local communities, ecological, social, um, regarding building relationships and normalizing indigenous land management traditions in our world for a more sustainable future that seems to be um, was was more harmonious in the past. Yeah, I, you hit on the key word of relationships. Um, you know, it, it is about building relationships with people and working together. And building relationships also means building trust and um, building trust. It's, it's a lot because of this long history of colonialism in North America um, and in many countries around the world, colonialism has had its heavy footprint. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't try and we, do, we don't do this, this, this work. This is essential work. And one of the, you know, this, it's essential for the preservation of people and culture, but also for our planet because indigenous people you know, they're of the place, right? They're, they, they've been here in the case of North America for tens of, you know, 10,000 years or more um, since the last ice age in Canada. Um, and, and over those, that millennium, um, they lived with the land, lived, in fact, their worldview is that we are just one of the land where we are the land. We are one of many species that live on the land. And we have, uh, a responsibility to the land to look at, to care for for Mother Earth, and if we care for Mother Earth, then she will care for us. Um, and so it's very much a re- reciprocal, uh, you know, understanding. And um, and so the whole way of being on the land means knowing your ecosystems and uh, and and um, harvesting what you need, but only what you need, and and cultivating and caring for you know, populations of salmon and trees and uh, uh, clams and whatever, ha- you know, whatever your source of food is and medicines. And, and so that way of working with, with land is really what, you know, what we ta- call nowadays ecosystem-based management. And, and so it's knowing your ecosystems. And, you know, the way we've approached management in a colonial Western way is, is not really ecosystem-based management. It's more like, okay, here's a recipe. We're going to do the same thing all over the place. You know, I know that's very crass, but it's, um, it is actually what we do. 
And so we, we, we can't afford to keep doing that because each ecosystem is, is different and we need to be paying attention to how it's responding, how it's behaving, how it's changing with climate change, and then be in there with our hands and our minds and our hearts wor working with these communities, these plant communities, as the Indigenous people did for thousands and thousands of years. So from a Western point of view, we need to unlearn how we view the world and relearn or from our indigenous roots, because we all have them at some point, um, how to be with the land and one with the land. And, and really, you know, if you look even, you know, at global maps of where carbon stocks are, where biodiversity is, it overlays with indigenous managed territories. You know, 80% of biodiversity is in indigenous managed territories be because of their traditional values and, and worldview and way of working with the land. So that's a big message, isn't it? And, and the IPCC has said, you know, that the way to re, you know, restore our carbon stocks is to, is to um, work with indigenous traditional use of land um, to re-engage with indigenous knowledge systems, um, to re-engage with indigenous worldviews. And that's, that's the key. That's one of the main keys of, of restoring our ecosystems and our carbon stocks. Well said, thank you for that description. And um, I think that leads nicely to a, a, um, a as a professor, I know that um, you have recommendations for our prescriptions for moving forward and you've touched on a few of them, but if there were some simple things that were absolutely like undeniable, people can always do this. What are some of the things that you would recommend our audience members take away today and future audience members watching this and yeah, uh, along I, the line. Yeah. So there's some key things and, and it's hard for, you know, in modern days, because, you know, in North America, U S and Canada, the same that about 80% of people live in urban areas. And so it's harder to reconnect with forests and do this kind of land stewardship. Um, but and so, you know, the danger of that is that we ignore what's being done on the land and we we actually give over our power and our um, and our ingenuity to big corporations to do that for us. And that has led us to a great tragedy, really. Um, and so we need to re-engage with getting our hands on the in the land in the land. Um, and so how do you do that? You you gotta <clears throat> learn how to love it again um, and to, to be out there. So, so the, the first thing is to go out, go out in the forest, go out in the prairie, go out to your wetland um, and just do something there. Just be there, do something, volunteer, get your hands dirty. And then, then your, your, uh, your heart will melt for sure. So that's the first thing. And then this, the second thing is, you know, when we look at our global crisis, what are the first things that we need to do to stop the bleeding? And the first thing is to stop cutting down our old growth forests and destroying our ecosystems that are full of carbon. Um, and, and that's happening. And I can't, ex I can't emphasize this enough. It's happening every single day. Every single day in Western Canada, there are two and 3,000 year old trees falling um, because we are so short-sighted. And, and that's happening in the, in the Amazon, it's happening in the Congo. And, and so we need to really engage as a whole global community to stop this because it's madness, really. Um, it is truly madness if you look at the big picture. So stop cutting down our, our primary forests. And then the third thing is, to, you know, the forests that are damaged, and I, I mentioned this before, is we need to restore these forests, right? Like we need to be drawing down CO2 as, as quickly as we can. And our biggest natural sinks are forests and oceans, of course, and and. Uh, peatlands and wetlands. And so restoration of these ecosystems is crucial in that. And what scientists say is if we are able to restore these ecosystems that we can actually draw down CO2, or it can be about a third of the mitigation of climate change if we do this, if we properly manage these ecosystems. So that's number three. Um, I guess what's number four is, um, you know, how do you make this happen? And, and it can seem overwhelming and impossible when it's just you, um, you know, what can I do as a single person? But but there are things you can do, right? Like in the collective, and, and this is what I've learned from my forest studies is that a forest is a network and it's a social place. And we're wired the same way as human societies. And the power of a forest is in its networks and its collaborations and its social its social aspect. And, and that gives the forest incredible healing power, regenerative power, um, you know, a forest can rebound from a lot, you know, 
they have, and I've seen it happen over and over in my lifetime. And that's a great gift that I have uh, that's been given to me. Um, and I can tell you that forest recovery, and it's because they're wired to do that. And so as social communities ourselves, we are wired to work together to heal our planet as well in the same way. And that, so that is finding good leaders and who have good policies and making sure that those good leaders are held to account when they make a policy. Like if Joe Biden says, we're going to save old growth forests of the West, let's make sure that he follows through. And, you know, by the way, he did say that, um, but he's going to study it instead of stopping the logging. So, Hey, we've got another step to go to get Joe Biden back on board. And, and, you know, I should use an example of my prime minister, Justin Trudeau, you know, committed to net, no net deforestation. Well, Justin, you know, that doesn't quite add up that way. And so we need to go back and say, no, we need more from you. Um, so, yeah, so we have a lot of power, you know, in and we need to collectively do things like, you know, if it means being an activist, be an activist, right? Because really our next generations depend on it. Yeah, I love in your book when you mentioned that sometimes your heart was torn between your early career in forestry and not being able to go to the the activist event down yeah. the road. And so that really resonates with some of um some of everyone's ecological um career or ecological relationship. Um yeah. so to build that relationship even more with our audience here. So we've been talking a lot about how the fungal networks underground connect trees and they send nutrients and messages together. Mm -hmm. And then above ground, it's, it's been studied as well that some messages are sent as well. So could you tell us a little bit more about what messages, what else is going on in this social network? And I think that this may benefit the audience in being actionable or encouraged to uh, take action. Yeah. So, so what we've, what I, my group has found um, is that you know old trees, older trees, larger trees, um, they will transmit uh, resources, so water, uh, nitrogen, carbon, to other plants and trees in the ecosystem along what we call source sink gradients. So these big trees with high photosynthetic capacity um, have huge carbon stocks in them, lots of nitrogen, and they transmit these resources to smaller or, or needier trees around them. And so, um, and by doing that, it actually gives these smaller trees and plants um, more resources to maintain their vitality in, a, in an understory kind of setting. So, so new seedlings coming up in the understory of a forest then are able to you know, regenerate naturally and eventually become an adult. Um, and so, so that's one thing. It's just the tr- it's just the redistribution of resources to make a more even playing field in the forest. And even you know, trees will even send resources to other species. Um, that's the first thing that I found out, and and that which seems like you know that doesn't make sense from a Darwinian point of view. But when you look at it from a whole ecosystem point of view, diversity really does matter. It makes a healthier ecosystems ecosystem. And so when you actually start digging down into all of the ways that different species interact, they actually depend on each other being there to create, to to actually access all the niches in an ecosystem. I mean, I could go on about this for a long time. (laughs) I teach a course in forest ecology that explains a lot of this, um, but there's a beauty and a productivity in that diversity. Um, So other, so resources, then also just signaling. So trees will signal each other, so send messages and um, my research shows that, you know, it, it goes below ground. Others have found that these messages will transmit through the air above ground. They're carbon-based compounds, signals, um, the, basically amin- amino acids like glutamate, um, which is also a neurotransmitter in our, in our own brains, are transmitted through these fungal networks that then, um, you know, can serve as defense signals or signals to other trees that there might be um, danger or herbivory in the forest. And then these other, the neighbors will pick up these messages and they'll upgrade their own defense uh, arsenal. They'll start changing their, or start up, up, upregulating their own RNA and, and production of enzymes. And then when they're challenged by that herbivore, they're more defended against it. And so that's, that's another bit of information that transmits. And then a third piece is that trees will actually send signals about their identity. 
So whether or not they're related to each other or not, they can tell their relationship with each other, whether they're of the same kin or strangers. And then their behaviors are, they adjust their behaviors accordingly. So they might be more competitive. They might be more cooperative. They might um, send more, they, they do send more carbon to kin, for example, than to strangers. So those are the three areas that I study. Other people study other ways that information transmits through mycelial networks. And there was a recent study, it wasn't mine, but I read the paper and it was about actually electrochemical signals that were that were detected using basically electrical mapping of what these signals look like. And they were very complex, as complex as, as a, a human language. Um, and so these uh, it's electrochemical signaling that involves chemicals and electrical potential gradients. And, and that's how this, this works. And so when you say the social life of the forest, you really mean it. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just a really deep connection between people and nature that you have been able to provide for us in the modern world that is so lacking. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, if I could step in, I think it's time for us to transition to some questions from, from the viewers. Um, uh, well, thank you for pouring in. <laughs> um, one one uh, question is is just one of of a uh, of, per, of perspective. How how much of the old growth forest is left in the United States and Canada? Um, yes, yeah. as a percentage. Yes, that's a great question. So, um, I, um, in Canada, um, well, I can speak to British Columbia in particular, where I live, and there was just a recent analysis done of the percentage of forests that are like the iconic old growth. So when I say iconic, I mean the big old growth that you think of the big cedars and hemlocks and spruce trees. Um, when you think of old growth forests, that's what's in your mind. They're generally valley bottom forests. Um, and we only have about 3% of those left in British Columbia, 3% of what was originally there. Um, and that 3% figure is, you know, it is common. Um, I was just talking to somebody who was living in the redwood forest of the US and the redwoods, there's only 4% of the original forest left. Um, so we're down to the last few percent. And, and I think that this, you know, in, in, in the Amazon rainforest, I don't know what percentage is left, um, but the, the heart of Peru and Ecuador, the, the sacred headwaters are still relatively intact. The Brazil Amazon is, is getting harvested at a more rapid rate. Um, so there's probably a higher percentage of those forests left than in North American forests. Um, but still, you know, worldwide, these primary forests are under deep, deep threat. Um, yeah, so, and it's really important to save what we have left. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Fred would like to know, um, how do you suggest we recreate from scratch functional urban or suburban forests? This is a very city coming from a city perspective. Yeah, no, that's hear. that's a, it's a great question because it's super important that we do this because you know this is where people really learn how to work with ecosystems. If most of us are living in urban areas, it's important from a people from a humans learning uh, and loving their forest perspective, and and also just for our own our own health because you know trees provide healthier environments. You know the temperatures. Uh, our surface temperatures are lower, people suffer less from heat stress. Um, where you have a treed community, then you know they, it's able to um, mitigate flooding, um, hurricanes, you know, there's all kinds of benefits of, of having good, healthy urban forests. So an urban, a lot of urban forests, you know, were designed by architects or landscape architects with, you know, with more like visual beauty uh, in mind of Manicure, more manicured European settings, but these aren't necessary. These are not the healthiest kinds of ecosystems. So thinking, you know, to basic principles, what does a forest, uh, you know, a tree need? It needs neighbors. Um, so we know now that forests are social and trees are social. So having an isolated tree along a boulevard is is not the best for a tree. They get awfully, you know, lonely. Um, they need neighbors to buffer against the extremes of climate and, you know, all kinds of dangers around. Um, and um, and they need good soil. So if you know a lot of urban soils are gravel or fill or you know they don't have good soil biology in them. So restoring soil is important. Um, 
And so, you know, those are those, and then good, good stock, good growing stock that's well adapted to that site. That's, you know, not necessarily an exotic species, but something that's more native and locally adapted is the best. So, so those are the, you know, that's what I would do. I would, if I were starting from scratch, I would grow whole forests, make parks, you know, not just boulevards, but whole parks um, where you get a whole ecosystem that's relatively intact, where, where you can go and work with and, and, and these trees can, it will protect each other so that when that calamity comes along, that it'll still be there, you know, when there's that big freak ice storm or that big freak heat dome or, you know, whatever happens um, is inevitably coming our way. Thank you. Along the very interesting idea of lonely trees, um, I have a um, question from Pam Carlson, who says, I live in the city of Chicago, a few blocks from the oldest oak in Chicago, a huge hundred years, hundreds mm, year old tree sweet. that's located on a street parkway. And Chicago takes very special care of her. And she believes this is a mother tree. What are your thoughts of her giving support to other native trees within her area under an urban situation when her own native forest is gone? Does, does it work that way? Um. So, you know, I mean, just even if your urban forest is is gone, um, or if your forest is gone and you just have a few urban trees, those trees are extremely valuable. So that that old oak tree, um, I would protect her as much as I possibly could too. Um, she will be the nucleus of regenerating a forest around her, um, and the native plant community is still native to that area, right? Like. Plants and forests, you know, their first driver of why they are the composition of that forest, um, the structure of that forest is driven by climate and, and soil. And so that is all a very local thing, right? There's a lot of local adaptation that goes on in plants. And so if you're bringing in, you know, exotic trees to fill in that community, you're much better off, even if those native plants haven't been there for a long time, to restore them to the local ecosystem. Because you know they they're you know they're locally adapted to their climatic area, as I said. They're also locally adapted to the soil organisms that are there, the pollinators, all the other creatures that have evolved to 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 survive in that particular area. Thank you. Um, Meredith has a question about the increasing forest fires and devastation of large swaths of, of wooded lands. Um, do you think your practices are going to be more widely accepted to restore those swaths? And what's the long-term impact of their loss? And uh, is it a substantial contribution to climate change? Well, wildfire certainly is a substantial contribution to, wild, to climate change. It's like, it's a positive feedback, you know, like as, as it gets hotter, we get more wildfires. The, the wildfires emit more CO2 um, and the land becomes, you know, denuded of plants when, and it's harder for plants to come back. And so it just kind of goes down this slippery slope. Um, and so preventing preventing large scale wild, wildfires that are really severe and unprecedented is really important. Um, and how do you do that? So one, and, and this method is, you know, people are talking about this more and more, and that is to re reinstate, you know, prescribed burning because, um, you know, a lot of our ecosystems fire has been excluded. I'm sure your audience all has heard this before. Um, and, and that means that fuels have been building up in these forests, especially in the West, um, for a long time. Whereas, you know, there, historically there was a lot of First Nations or Aboriginal or Indigenous burning that kept these understories cleaned out. Um, and they were, you know, cleaned out of, of trees and, and ladder fuels. Ladder fuels are just trees that, you know, climb up to the canopy of the main canopy of a forest. And so then when you've got so much fuel and you've got this heat and the heat generates more lightning, you've got all of the things you need to create a fire. And these fires can be very severe under those when you have all of those things in place. And severe fires burn down into the mineral soil. They can, you know, destroy destroy organic layers where the fungi are, the seeds are, and then it gets harder for the forest to regenerate. So mitigating or trying to reduce the severity and extent of these kinds of fires is really important. So how do you do that? So prescribed burning is one way. Um, in prescribed burning, then you can make the fire less severe. So, you know, burning at, at, at a cooler time of the year, a wetter time of the year, like spring burns, for example, or late fall burns, depending on where you are. Um, and then 
you know, you know trying to, to not let it get away so that it burns down the big trees because those big trees actually keep the ecosystem moister. Um, if they're re still remaining, they provide seed for the next generation. They have thicker bark and so they're le more resistant to future fires. And so that's really important to have these sort of cooler fires um, that are more controlled, that, that don't get out of hand. And, and I think that is the way, you know, we, we need to deal with this. Because once you get a severe fire, it's hard to get the forest back and you have this huge pulse of CO2 back to the atmosphere. And, and you know, and it just really just kind of snowballs, so. Thank you. I'll, um, we're running we're running low on time, so I'm, I'm going to ask two more questions. Um, and um, then I thought I'd give Matt a chance to ask if he has one more that he's dying to ask. He's, um, no, he's okay. All right. Um, th these are a bit lighter. Um, the, uh, one person asks, um, did you contribute to the development of the movie Avatar that had a, a powerful focus on the mother tree for all the yeah. its life? Sounds like your contribution. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, I did in a way. Um, it was, uh, you know, at the time, James Cameron, that movie came out in about 2004 or five. And I had already published, you know, 10 years earlier, my seminal paper on mycorrhizal networks and communication between trees. And I had heard, you know, I, somebody called me up and said, hey, did you know we're considering this idea and the avatar is going in the home tree? And, and I didn't, I was kind of, I was a young mother at the time. I didn't really have time to really delve into it. And I just sort of brushed it off as, oh, I hope it's a good movie. And then, and then I saw the movie and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, and since then, um, James Cameron is has reached out to me and we've we've actually working on a documentary film on the science behind Avatar. So I just filmed a whole uh, sequence with his, one of his producers and a couple of his directors on the West coast of BC um, about, about Avatar and the science behind the networks and, um, and these, the home tree. And, and that, that documentary film is coming out in uh, six epi episodes on Disney plus, and it's going to be released at the same time as the next Avatar movie comes out probably January. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun to know about. Thank you very much. Um, finally, um, I'm going to ask, um, you've probably been asked this before, what's your opinion of Richard Powers's The Overstory? Um, there's a character in there based on you, which is quite an honor for such an excellent book. Um, what, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I love the book. It's a, a wonderful book, um, a beautiful piece of literature. I wish I could write like that. <laughs> um, and the his character, Patricia Westerfall, I thought was a lovely character. I mean, it, it's a character that's based partly on me and partly on um, on, on a couple other people. Um, but I was honored uh, to learn that that he had he had based that character partly on me. Um, yeah, I, I think that she's a bit different in that. Um, I think that, you know, she kind of left her science and became a, a vocal, you know, advocate or more vocal, but not, you know, I feel like I'm just continuing on. I, I just keep plowing on. And um, even though I've had a lot, a lot of things happen to me, like she did to her as well. Um, I think you just can't give up and just keep moving, keep fighting the fight. Excellent words to conclude with. Thank you very much. Um, thank you both of you for your time tonight. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, and I, I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people to get involved and to start caring more. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to mention again that um, Suzanne's book is available to order through the bookstall um, in hardcover or as of today in paperback. Um, thanks also to our co-sponsors and of course to everyone who watched tonight. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Thank you.